morning, First Christian Church of Garland. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome to Sunday morning, and I feel your love through the camera. Glad you're here. Today is the fourth Sunday of Pentecost, and if you can believe it or not, 17 weeks since we last gathered for in-person worship in our church of sanctuary. That would have been March 8th. You remember that far back. Uh, there is good news, though. Your executive committee, along with the building review committee, has determined that we exiles of social isolation will begin returning July 26th. And let this be our advent this summer. Four weeks, four Sundays, until we walk through the doors of our church building to be together again. Uh, you received a letter in the email yesterday. In the coming weeks, you'll receive specific instructions on how we plan together to ensure each other's safety. Until then, let's all pray together that the pandemic subsides. I am joined this morning by uh, my colleague in ministry, the Reverend David Hargrave, and an incredible host of musicians, including Stan McGill, our expert choir master. Uh, Stan is now in his uh, 60th year. You started as a <laughs> musical prodigy at 10 years old. And now he's still going strong here doing music at First Christian Church of Carla. Sherry Dakin, our effervescent piano player, and our special guest playing the flute and making us all wish that we had paid more attention to music when we were growing up, uh, the flute player Melanie Kennedy. And our cameramen, uh, Julian Alaldi and Jason Collier, who always make me nervous when they mess around with the phone while I'm talking <laughs> into it. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Sunday Morning Live. Good morning. We complete our month of outreach today by looking even more closely, right around the corner actually, with a reminder of the wonderful ministry of Good Samaritans of Garland. Their purpose is simple, really, feeding, helping, serving. And the needs are even more acute during this challenging time of COVID-19. Just consider their numbers as found on their website from this last month. 4,748 individuals served. And 2,120 family needs filled. Check out their website. You'll find many ways we as individuals and we as a church can be a part of this ministry. Food gifts are always needed, of course. In particular, at this time, they are low on peanut butter, canned meat, canned green beans, canned corn, and dried pasta. But remember, while these food donations are always helpful, most helpful are financial donations. Quite simply, they have more purchasing power than do we and can feed even more of our neighbors with money than unused perishable donations. I encourage you to go to their website at www.goodsamaritansofgarland.org and find out more information about how you and about how we can help. And while you're at it, look up the parable of the Good Samaritan in your Bible. Luke 10, 25 through 37. That, as they say, is what it's all about. We gather to worship this day with many needs and in so many Sunday morning need moods. Some of us are ready to shout, make a joyful noise to the Lord while others echo the psalmist's lament, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, hear my voice. Some are looking for guidance and direction from the word of God. As we read in that word, more to be desired are they than gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Some long passionately to draw close to God as a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. 
God stands ready and able to respond to our every need. In that assurance, let us worship. so conditioned every time we say the Lord's Prayer to want to start singing the um, Gloria Patra. Doc's off? No, that would be a good offering. But one of those songs. One of those songs. Okay. Um, I, it says in your bulletin um, that we're going to read 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 30. When you come together, it's not really to eat the Lord's Supper. But when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of it. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner 
will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat the bread and drink the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Okay, well, there's um, record unemployment. Um, some businesses are failing. There's a pandemic, and it's worldwide by virtue of the word. Uh, what else is going on? Oh, yes, there was an altercation uh, in San Diego last week. Did you read about it? Did you see it? A customer in the middle of all of these dramatic things was offended when a Starbucks barista told her that he could not serve her coffee without a mask. She snapped a photo of said barista, 19-year-old Lennon, posted it to her Facebook because what else could he do when there's an argument? And posted it to the internet to shame the young man. She said she had a medical condition and that her well-being is far more important than than anyone else's concern, and back and forth they went, and it's still going on to this minute. How have we managed to turn a pandemic, a truly worldwide public health concern event, into guerrilla warfare over masks? Lizzie Post, uh, the daughter of the late Emily Post, writes in favor of masks, but, but she says that simple, common courtesy on both sides is probably the only strategy. And she's probably right. A beloved member of the church wrote me a note a couple of weeks ago uh, about a church he knows in Louisiana. They decided to divide the sanctuary into two sides. Lucky for them, east and west. West, mask. Um, east, no mask. Uh, in our church, that wouldn't work. We have a center aisle that divides us between north and south. Not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, was lamenting this mask thing to a friend. I said, the evidence is pretty clear that wearing a mask significantly reduces the risk of community spread. We can't stop the virus. It's going to be a while until we get a vaccine. But at least I said, you can wear a mask. And I said, how hard is that? How inconvenient would that be? And he said, well, the problem, Dan, is that the difference between high risk and low risk runs along the fault line between older and younger. Young people aren't as much at risk, and frankly, they just don't want to give up their freedom to put on a mask. And that's that. Something like, I'm okay, you're not okay, and that's your problem. And just so we're on the same page, uh, let, me, um, let me repeat a few facts, if you're into facts these days. The virus spreads through droplets that carry the virus. The mask significantly reduces the spread of those droplets. The mask isn't to protect you is to protect the other person. Some people carry the virus without symptoms, knowingly spread it to others, so that even when you feel invincible and well, you are still impacting other people. Underlying health conditions make a person higher risk. These conditions can't be cured, so that one solution to protect the vulnerable ones in our midst is to wear a mask. Okay, well, writers of the Atlantic Monthly say wearing a mask isn't a political statement. It's a matter of supporting the public good. Uh, Dr. Tuznik, who does uh, medicine at UT Health in San Antonio, she says that wearing a mask is a courtesy. Uh, this morning, I want to go even further and say that this attitude of courtesy is a Christian thing. Now, if you like to Google... Uh, after the service is over, Google New York Life Insurance ad February 2020 and put in the words of the ancient Greeks that four words for love. That ad, that music, those pictures is probably the clearest, simplest, 30-second definition of what I'm trying to say to you this morning. The ancient Greeks had four words for love. Philo love, love between friends. Storge, love between grandchild and grandparents. Eros, the love of lovers. And a fourth kind of love, agape love. Agape love is, is love in action. It takes courage and foresight and thoughtfulness and sacrifice. 
It's the opposite of selfishness and self-centeredness. It's the kind of love that is, that is willing to do what is reasonably necessary to care for someone else. Agape love is strength, not weakness. It is not democratic or republican. It's the kind of love that we celebrate at the Lord's table. What are we saying when we come to the table? Do this in remembrance of me. Who is me? Me is not me, and it's not you. It's Jesus. And when we remember Jesus, what do we remember? We remember the overriding character of his life, that all his actions were motivated by agape love. And Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And why did he do that? Agape love. And so what might it mean to celebrate the Lord's Supper? In this morning's passage, Paul teaches that celebrating the Lord's Supper means that we at least aspire to live and behave and act like Jesus did. That if we take the Lord's Supper, if we say it's the most important thing about these 30 or 40 minutes, we at least try to see the connection between the bread and the cup and the lives that we live. And this is what concerned Paul. Prior to taking the Lord's Supper, the church gathered to have what we might call today a, a potluck. Only they weren't pooling and sharing their food. They were segregating along party lines. Rich were over here eating their food. The poor were over here eating whatever they could get together. They were divided like this so that when the time came for the potluck event to end and the Lord's Supper to begin, they did not have any oneness of mind. They weren't acting in synchrony. They, they didn't have regard for one another. It, it was everyone for himself. Paul said, it doesn't work that way. First, he said, discern the body of Christ. First, acknowledge that you are part of a community. First, honor your obligation to each other. First, protect the dignity of the poor. Guard the weaker. And then, and then, he said, and then eat the bread. Why is this so hard for us? Lawrence Welburn says most of what prompted Paul's writing to the Corinthian church was an apparent confusion of allegiances. Some of the newer converts were still struggling to define the difference between being a, a free citizen of Rome and a baptized member of the Christian community. One allegiance was based on a focus of personal freedoms and rights. The other was based on sacrificial concern for others. When we come to the Lord's table, I don't think it's that hard to figure out where our allegiance is. Do this in remembrance of me. But if that isn't direct enough, maybe I can help. Wear a mask for Christ's sake. Let us pray. Lord, we don't live to our, ourselves alone by, by the manner of your life. You, you taught us this. Remind us, disciples of yours, countless times we see you reaching past comfort places to help someone in need. Bearing in patience with Nicodemus who kept asking inane questions late at night. Seeing past the details of a sordid history to give hope to a woman at a well. Seeing the best in a few Galileans, Peter, James, and John all the others despite their frequent missteps, having compassion for those who came without making necessary food preparations, going to unimaginable lengths, taking the insults of those who didn't know better, praying alone in the garden, forfeiting your holy right to call down the legion of angels in the hour of your greatest need, enduring the humiliation of the cross, because why? For our sake, Lord. Because we knew not what we did because as you knew we needed saving and we couldn't save ourselves and if not for your sacrificial life we would be like lost sheep and so this is our prayer in big and small ways in these days of social inconvenience teach us to be 
behave with sacrificialness and not self-centeredness. We pray in Christ's name. As I drove yesterday morning, I was noticing the forecasted haze due to the Saharan dust that's come our way. And as I bemoaned the lack of clear skies and fully breathable air, I also was struck by the reminder that we are all connected on this earth the desert's dust on the other side of the world is ours <laughs> for a while. Just as climate changes from our part of the world affect those on the other side of the globe. It's a good reminder, it seems to me, as we share with one another this communion on this Lord's Day. For just as we are sharing in the bread and the cup, which remind us of God's love as manifest through Christ Jesus, so are others in every part of this world. We are truly in communion, in covenant with God's children everywhere. How blessed we are. Let us pray. Loving God, as we share in these elements today, bread broken as was the body of your Son, wine poured out as was his blood, remind us as we pray that we are blessed beyond measure to be your children and brothers and sisters in Christ. For it's in his name we pray this. Amen. On that last night of Jesus' life when he came together with his disciples, we are told through the Apostle Paul and others, and we share it still today with one another, that Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he shared it with his disciples saying, this is my body, which is to be broken for you. Do this and remember me. Also after supper then, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he shared it with his disciples, saying, this cup is the blood of the new covenant, which is to be poured out for you. Each time you drink of it, Remember me, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you remember the Lord's death and proclaim his resurrection until he comes. <laughs>
Spirit upon us, Lord, that we may more fully engage our baptism, that we may accept the cost that belong to our life with you, that we may embrace the joys that only you can give. Move us beyond ourselves, our favorite cliches, our tired resentments, our worn habits. Move us beyond these to your newness. Make us light. Make us ready. Make us open that we may become a resounding doxology through your passion and into your victory. We pray in the name of Jesus crucified, Lord of the Church. <laughs> 